All right. Hey, everybody, how are you making it through the day? Pretty good? Are we there? Looking forward to drinking a little bit? Shortly? All right, this presentation will help, I think, with the need, need to drink a little bit. It's a little bit heavier than some of the other presentations, but I think we're going to get through it. We're going to be a team. All right, let's get started. So a long time ago, um, in the early days of the social internet, if you can remember a time before Twitter, when we were still on the MySpace, I, uh, I ran a bunch of media properties. And so the, um, the, the thing that we were doing was basically like taking, it was like professional blogging. So there was a time when like having a job where you got paid to post content on the internet was really weird and really novel, and everybody looked at me like I was some sort of freak, but it was an, an actual job. Um, and what we did to get more traffic to our website, because there was a team of us, it was like one of the first professional blogs on the internet, so there was like 40 people who all contributed part-time. And the, uh, we would make friends with people who were popular on this website called Dig. So anybody remember Dig? I can kind of see you in the audience. All right, all the old people raised their hand. Awesome, okay. So Dig was like a precursor to Reddit, kind of. You would like publish things to Dig, and then people could upvote it if they liked it and downvote it if they didn't like it, right? Um, kind of like a lot of the way that like the social uh, recommendation internet works now. But the, uh, so people who were influential, who'd like posted a lot of popular stories, their content would more quickly go to the top of Dig. And you know, if you got on the front page of Dig, more people would see it, more people would click through and go to the URL, whatever you posted, your blog post or whatever. And so we would make friends with those really influential people, and we would say, hey, buddy. Uh, we would send them messages on AOL Instant Messenger. If you remember AOL Instant Messenger, again, old people in the room don't need to raise your hands. It was like a precursor to, I don't know, Slack or Gchat or whatever. Um, or Twitter, I guess, based on how we used it. In any case, so we would make friends with them. We would send them messages on an instant messenger. We would say, hey, hey, buddy, I've got this, this blog post. I really want to get a lot of eyes on it. Can you post it to Dig? And we were friends at that point, so they would say, yeah, no problem. And then as soon as they posted it, I would send a message to our internal company chat, which was 40 people, or you know, 40, 50, 60 as the company grew. And I'd say, hey, quick, go upvote this story on Dig right now. Somebody popular posted it. And so we would all go to Dig, we would upvote it right away, and it would instantly go to the top of Dig and send tens of thousands of page views to our website. It was like clockwork. It's also pretty manipulative. But at the time, this was like before Twitter, and it felt like we were just kind of hustling, right? Um, but that fundamental flaw, the idea that if I can manufacture the idea of popularity, that somehow it like gains more social status on the internet, should have been a sign. It should have been a warning. Because even though at the time, before Twitter and Facebook were massively popular, or before Twitter had even been launched, like, we were starting to think about the internet as something that had a lot of potential. That like social communication on the internet and the way that we share information online was this great like, way to break down barriers. And if you saw the first keynote today, a lot of that, uh, the speaker actually covered some of these topics where it used to be that only you know, gatekeepers could make things, um, could like, share information and share their ideas with the world, and we all just had to accept it. So maybe you worked for an important publication, like the New York Times, or maybe you were a TV anchor, or maybe you went to the right university, or maybe your family just had a lot of money. One way or another, that gave you influence over everybody else, but the internet was supposed to change that. Twitter and Facebook and other social media were supposed to change that. It was supposed to be that if you posted your ideas online and they were better than other people's ideas, it didn't matter who you were, it didn't matter where you were from, your ideas would be the most successful. That was like the best type of open democracy and free-flowing information that we could possibly imagine. Some dude writing a blog post in his mom's basement could be just as impactful as an opinion writer at the New York Times. But of course, here we are. That's not how it worked out. Now we live in a world where these systems are manipulated, kind of in the way that at the same time as we believed in these lofty ideals of the internet, we were manipulating the systems that were meant to surface the content that was most important. We were already kind of screwing around with the fundamental mechanics. And the fact that this is possible has led us to an internet that we can't trust. We can't trust the conversations that we're having on social media. We can't trust the conversations that we're having on Facebook. We can't even trust the, the information that's being fed to us. Is it real news? Is it hyper-partisan news? Is it fake news? What is it? 
And so I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story about how I came into understanding this problem um, and really understanding the mechanics of it and how it relates to the conversations that we're having now about political disinformation. So I should apologize, I should have apologized in advance. There's a lot of potentially offensive imagery in this presentation. It covers a lot of uh, far-right extremism in the US, so there's a handful of swastikas, some offensive gestures. It's not a nice group of people, so we'll just get that out of the way right now. If that's the kind of thing that, um, that uh, is difficult for you, you actually probably might want head to the, head to another talk. <laughs> there's a tent, there's other talks, there's drinks I hear, you can just cut to the drinking early. Um, so, um, my background is in studying uh, extremism and terrorism. Um, looked a lot at the way that communities like terrorist groups like ISIS would manipulate the social internet in order to create this outsized impression of importance and strength and, and radicalize people. And radicalization is basically this idea that an otherwise well, probably not a healthy person, but somebody who's a vulnerable person can be sort of sucked into a world where uh, the viewpoints are incredibly extreme, uh, they're inconsistent with reality, they don't sort of exist in the same kind of mainstream social world that the rest of us do, and that because they live in this kind of extremist information space, that they can be driven to violence. That's the idea of radicalization. So I started looking into domestic radicalization in the US because it seemed like our political conversation was getting really polarized. There was new types of participants in the political conversation that are very uncommon, or were very uncommon in the US, or at least we all thought so. People like neo-Nazis, people like white supremacists, people who we kind of pushed to the fringes who didn't really have much of a voice online, for good reason. Um, of course, they noticed, and that's always an uncomfortable thing. So, but what I, what I wanted to do was basically see if I could use data science to understand like this ideology and how much of an impact it was really having on the public conversation. Is it actually true that Nazis were taking over the internet? Are they actually having an impact in convincing other people to see the world in the way that they do? Because they have just as much access to social media as everybody else, so it seemed like an important problem and one that everybody was trying to answer as like political pundits. You know, you'd see like talking heads on television talking about the change and the downfall of American society. And what I really wanted to know is could we measure it? Could we measure people's changes in beliefs? Um, so here's how I started. I basically found some people who I knew were um, the kind of extremist I was looking for. So, and, and at the time, Twitter's kind of cleaned up their site a little bit from this type of activity, but at the time this was really easy. You just type in some racial epithets into Twitter's search and like, boom, out pops these like super offensive um, extremist accounts. And so I found a handful of these, and we'll call these my seed accounts. So I created a small little network of, I think, less than 100 accounts, and I said, all right, I'm going to focus on just these. I've manually reviewed them all. They all have something offensive in their profile photo, something offensive in their name, something that lets me know that they belong to this kind of extremist, far-right, white supremacist, neo-Nazi, whatever type of ideology. And then I built a network. And so the way that this happens on, I think most people who have anything to do with social media are familiar with this idea. Everybody you interact with is kind of linked to you in some way. And what I did was say, let's take these 100 accounts and look at anybody who they interact with, and then look at anybody who those interactors interact with, and kind of spidered out and built a large network. And pretty quickly, you get to a large number of accounts. So I was up to about a little over a million users on Twitter. And by the time you get to like the interactors of the interactors, you're no longer in an extremist space. You're dealing with a lot of people who are just like mainstream US conservatives. So not extremist at all, um, just people who for one reason or another at some point agreed with somebody who agreed with a Nazi or a white supremacist, or at least interacted with them on social media in some way. So it's a pretty wide net, a pretty big segment of the uh, Twitter user base. And what I knew I needed to do was segment out of that larger 1.3 million users, the subset that was actually the extremist group that I was looking for. So I needed more than 100 accounts to do my analysis, but at the same time, I definitely couldn't look at this network of 1.3 million users, because like I said, that was pretty mainstream, and we're looking for these like ideological extremists. And so I started, uh, I trained a model um, uh, to basically uh, identify swastikas and photos. 
Um, now I think it'd be more popular to do this with like TensorFlow or some other machine learning library. Um, but at the end of the day, it was just uh, training a model to recognize that shape and then looking for it in any profile photo. Because I think it's, I thought, and I think still, it's a fair assumption that if you put a swastika in your profile photo online, you're kind of signaling that you're a Nazi, and I don't think there's any other way to think about it. So I thought, safe, safe. Like basically anything, anything that a user like this posts on social media was of interest to me, because what I really want to understand is can I measure their ideology? Whatever they talk about, I want to know if I can infer how they see the world based on their language on social media, given this kind of strong signal. OK, and as a check, I made sure that the content they were posting was the sort of thing that I might expect. And they didn't, I don't know, accidentally put a swastika in their profile photo and it had nothing to do with it. Maybe they didn't understand what it meant. Maybe they thought it was that peace symbol, but just backwards. I don't know. Maybe there are some people in the world who think this way. In any case, as you can tell by the content, it was pretty consistent with what you'd expect. Um, direct threats on US politicians, white supremacist content, highly offensive, um, and to the point of in, like, inciting political violence. OK. And then again, just to make sure that this subgroup that I was looking at, this core group of extremists, was actually different from the mainstream conservative audience that was sort of loosely, very loosely affiliated with them, like one or two hops removed. And it's a pretty clear difference. So the data that I was looking at was from 2015 and 2016. So as you can expect, most mainstream conservatives were supported the then Republican candidate for president, Donald Trump. Um, and they talked about him a lot because he was their candidate for president. That was in the news all the time. That was sort of the main topic of conversation on social media. But then the other group, the extremist group, was focused on something else. So sure, they mentioned politics, but they also mentioned their race a lot. This is just a tip. If you are a white person and you talk about your race on the internet, you're probably not good. Pro tip, pro tip, keep it to yourself. <laughs> They're also proud, they're like proud of their race. They're anti, anti a lot of things. They talk about being white nationalists a lot. And so basically, again, like further verification that I'd identified a distinct, kind of a discrete subset of the overall conversation. Cool. All right. Now, I wanted to see if I could basically model and measure their ideology, which is pretty nebulous, but machine learning can help. So anybody here familiar with word embeddings, like word to vec models, doc to vec models. OK, a smattering of people. So conceptually, like the math involved is very complicated. The intuition is not that complicated. So the way that most of us understand language is through context. Um, for example, if you read like a 1,000 examples of sentences like these, you'd start to realize that there are like the king walks down the street, the queen walks down the street, the man walks, there are like things that can walk down the street. I don't know what any of those things are, let's pretend that you were learning language from scratch, but there's a thing that can walk down the street, and somehow that thing is different from other things that can like get up your nose, or like go underwater, or fly around in space. Like you would never say like the king got sucked up my nose, or like maybe you would say that, but like it wouldn't make any sense. And so based on these types of context clues, Right? If you have any preschool-aged children, their teachers probably say things like, use your context clues when you're understanding new words. This is basically what the algorithms behind these word vec models do. They look at language, and they basically uh, like analyze the, the context that in which words are used, and that's how they basically start to understand what words mean. Like, they infer meaning. But the way they do it is pretty mathy. So they basically assign lots of scores to all of the words in some corpus of documents. So like. If I took this, whatever it was, let's say it was like a million like, Nazi tweets, and I, I, I told a model that the entire, your entire world, word Devec model, is this one million Nazi tweets. Go read all of those tweets and tell me what words in that universe mean. And that's basically what it does. So it, it, and it does this by like having 100, 300, 500 like individual properties, and it scores each word in the corpus based on those properties. And it doesn't have any real-world sense of what those properties are, but if we looked at them as humans, we'd basically understand that it was like, oh, I get it. Like, each word has like a, 
a royalty score or a masculinity score or a femininity score or like a seems like something you could do on a street score or whatever, right? There's like very semantic real world things that end up getting attached to each of these scores. And if you plot these, like these vectors, if you plot these points in space, then you can basically play the math back to the human beings, and the math gives us the semantics of the language. Like, it helps us understand what the words mean based on the way that each of the words were scored. And this is all going to make sense in a second. I'm going to get back to stuff that's a little bit less data science-y. But, but because we are looking at like words that have similar scores end up having similar meanings. That's the important part. So like niece and aunt and sister are pretty similar words because they're used in a very similar context, relatively speaking, to other words in the English language. And those words are really different than king and queen. And there's all sorts of like cool word math you can do. You can say like king minus man equals queen. Like that's how this type of like uh, this type of word math works. So it's really useful for, again, kind of giving a machine a real world sense of the meaning, like the human meaning, the semantic meaning of words. OK. So you can also do cool things with models like this and say, tell me all the words that are most similar to something I'm interested in. So in this case, back to Nazis, I was thinking, What's a word that Nazis would use that'd be really different than everybody else? I don't know, a lot of words because they're Nazis, but like one that's kind of a, they're terrible human beings, but, but one that's kind of iconic, or one that's a very representative of their sort of distinct um, and radicalized extremist worldview is the word Jewish, of course. Um, and so, I took one model, one of these word to vec models, that was trained on mainstream language, language from news articles, mainstream publications, typical social media conversation. And I said, OK, model, based on your understanding of the world, what other words are similar to the word Jewish? And it's kind of what you'd expect. It's other religious words. So Muslim, Arabs, Christian, Israeli, like, these words, okay, I get it. They're all like, we're talking about religious stuff. Uh, Judaism is a religion. Jewish is a religious kind of signifier. Okay, cool. We're talking about religious things. Jewish must have something to do with religion. Awesome. Okay, cool. But then you ask the same thing of the model that's been trained on a bunch of Nazi language, and you get a slightly different result. So it turns out, to Nazis, Jewish is not a religious signifier, but it's actually an epithet. So Nazis on social media talk about Jewish people in the same way that they talk about communists, liberals, satanic people, homosexuals. This is, this is the Nazi mindset. This is basically the Nazi ideology about Jewish people represented in a machine learning model. And now we want to be able to say, can we measure the difference between these two? Can we give ourselves an actual numeric representation of what it means to take a mainstream population and the distance between them and a radicalized population? How can we measure that? And so this is exactly what I did. I took this larger network of you know, a million users, mainstream American conservatives, and I measured the similarity of their use of the word Jewish, the mathematical similarity, the ideological similarity, and I measured that relative to the Nazi group. And I measured it over time. So January, February, March, April. Something big happens in April, I'm not really sure, but like, whoa. Mainstream American conservatives got really Nazi-ish starting in April. Which is, I mean, at least they did on social media. Um, so I did the same thing on Facebook, because I thought, man, Twitter must be a cesspool if that's the case. And no offense, any Twitter employees in the audience, but sometimes it's a bit of a cesspool. OK, so I went to Facebook, and I thought, Facebook, it's like clean, they moderate Facebook. Like, this is a space where like, you have to be kind to one another. We're all friends and communities and groups. It's totally different than Twitter. If Twitter's Gotham City, Facebook is like my little pony. Apologies to both Facebook and Twitter employees who might be in the audience for that characterization. And, and to my little pony and to Gotham City. <laughs> so unfortunately, Facebook actually wasn't any different. So again, right around April 2016, um, their language really started to change. The context in which 
mainstream American conservatives used the, used the word Jewish on Facebook got a lot more Nazi starting in April 2016, and it continued that way. Basically followed a very similar trajectory to Twitter, which is pretty scary. Also worth noting, this is only kind of related, um, I looked at the content that was most shared by American conservatives in the same period of time. And it, uh, so in the US, Fox News is um, kind of like, it's, it's like the conservative party's media outlet. Um, the, the liberal parties have their own media outlet, but Fox News is the one that kind of represents the conservative point of view most consistently. And so normally that's the kind of thing that conservative people share. But what I noticed was there was this other website called Breitbart that was also shared a lot in the same period of time. Now, Breitbart's a lot more popular now than it was, but this is like 2015, 2016. This is like, this is well before it became kind of a household name. And I was like, Breitbart? Why are they sharing Breitbart? What does Breitbart have to do with anything? So these are two Breitbart staffers and a D-list celebrity in the United States called Tila Tequila, Tia Tequila, something like that. Um, I think she was an adult film star and also like a pop star, it doesn't really matter. Um, provocateur. In any case, these are actual like Breitbart staffers at an event shortly after Donald Trump won the presidency. It was a celebration of his win, and there they were giving the Nazi salute. So, so Breitbart, sharing lots of Breitbart content, also um, sort of a secondary indication that you're you know, probably a little bit skewed. Um, but the, also worth noting um, is that the similarity of like this trend of people talking about Jewish people online in a similar way to Nazis had been going on for years on Breitbart. So this weird kind of fringe website that nobody had ever heard of that suddenly got injected into the political conversation in the United States in 2015 and 2016 at the same time as Americans' language was radicalizing in an anti-Semitic way. It turns out that that trend had been happening for a really long time amongst Breitbart users. So you can go back all the way to 2014 and you can look at the comments on Breitbart News and it gets increasingly as a steady march kind of more and more Nazi over time well before it started showing up in other mainstream spaces like Twitter and Facebook. Um, again, using kind of the same techniques. And so, I published a couple articles about this in the, some newspapers in the US, um, <laughs> and this was the response of the community that I had uh, drawn attention to. Um, that, that's uh, Donald Trump photoshopped on the head of a German SS officer cartoon, putting me in a gas chamber and hitting the go button which is a little uncomfortable at the time. But it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of a meme. I, I guess like it's not quite a direct, and it doesn't really matter. So anyway, the question I was asking myself is like, if this were true, if, this, if what I was seeing was an accurate representation of American political life, if it was an organic change of opinion, then what we were seeing was basically like a second civil war. So in the US, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago, we had a, a big fight between people who thought it was okay to hold slaves and people who didn't. It was a civil war. But the, this type of division, like this type of growing kind of far-right, anti-Semitic Nazi, like if it was happening at the level that I was seeing on social media, it, it frankly, like I couldn't believe that it wasn't a more popular topic of public conversation. Like why were we not talking about this all the time? Like we were basically a country that was about to crack apart and fight each other in the streets. But it then occurred to me that perhaps there was something else going on. Maybe. Hopefully there was something else going on. I don't know. So this is where the phenomenon that I was investigating started to tie into the conversation that we're now having about the kind of validity of public discourse on social media or the validity of the information that we're receiving on the internet or this larger topic of disinformation and information warfare. Because it turns out that in addition to actual Americans being radicalized and starting to adopt this new extremist point of view, in the midst of that conversation, or perhaps even driving that conversation, were hundreds of thousands of accounts across multiple, multiple social media platforms posting millions of pieces of content trying to like, capitalize on that division in American society and amplify it as often and as much as possible, intentionally. Basically trying to radicalize the American public in the same way that ISIS tried to radicalize its followers uh, in 2014 and 2015 taking the tactics of terrorist groups and amplifying them to a national scale. So I took the words that 
um, I, I basically tried to identify the accounts that were, um, or like I, I tried to work my way backwards to the timing of this whole thing. And so I looked for a bunch of words that were like the most abnormal. Like who's injecting new language into these different online communities? Who's driving this change in opinion? Who's like driving this change in ideology? And when is it happening? And what I found was that there was basically no overlap. Like Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and even Breitbart, um, all of these different platforms all have their own like individual cultures. So we don't talk in the same way. Like you don't use the same language on Twitter as that you do on Facebook. At the time, you only had 140 characters on Twitter, but you could write like these like massive novel length Facebook comments. Like the structure was totally different. There were different conventions. There were different inside jokes. So the language was really dis like disparate and dissimilar until again. April 2016, when all of a sudden there was a lot of similar overlapping language. There was a lot of new language injected into all of these communities at the same time. And if that were to be the case, again, it would have to be a massive upheaval in American society, or somebody would have to be doing it on purpose. Um, I also looked at all of the accounts that were injecting these, this new language into these conversations, and I said, all right, when did these accounts become active? Because if they've been active for a long time, maybe this really is a shift in public opinion. But it turns out that hadn't been the case. They were basically dormant, like thousands and thousands and thousands of accounts that had been asleep and all of a sudden, coincidentally, woke up right around April 2016 again. So we're starting to see the same pattern over and over and over and over again, obviously. There's a, a sort of a new participant and all of a sudden, hundreds of thousands or millions of new participants into these multiple online spaces at the same time, using the same language and driving the same shift in ideology. And this is relevant to today, not just because of the larger conversation around political disinformation, but anybody who's been following the news in the United States know that we've had a couple pretty, pretty scary um, events, pretty scary news cycles over the last week or so. Um, there was a domestic terrorist, a guy based in a state called Florida, who mailed bombs, actual explosives, to a dozen different kind of high-profile political donors and politicians, which would have, like, if he were successful, it would have been the, like, this was the largest assassination attempt, the, the, the largest in scale, like, basically in the history of the United States. He was unsuccessful, thankfully, but nobody has ever even attempted to assassinate that many people at the same time. Um, and also, there was a, um, uh, a guy who walked into a synagogue in Pittsburgh and killed 11 people. And both of these men, if you look at their online history, have been participating in exactly these types of anti-Semitic conversations in these type of extremist communities. And this journalist and uh, researcher, Jonathan Albright, um, went back through one of the terrorist timelines and found a specific point in time in April in 2016, when all of a sudden this man's conversation online shifted. He used to talk about random stuff, cars and sports and bodybuilding or whatever he was into. And then in April 2016, by the end of that month, he was talking about like the Jewish problem and globalism. And he was suddenly concerned about Muslims and ISIS and terrorists and like all things that had never been a part of his life until that time. And of course, like these men are psychopaths, but they're kind of like, it's like they're dry kindling waiting for somebody to light a match. Um, also worth pointing out in the broader context of like the quality of political conversation. So of course there's these actual ramifications like offline violence that happens based on online radicalization. And the fact that that online radicalization can be prompted and driven by powerful state intelligence agencies, I think should be pretty alarming in and of itself. Um, but again, there's the, this like, larger question about the quality of political discourse. And so the accounts that were driving this shift in language were also the ones, by the way, that were the most likely to use the most divisive political language. And so we had two political candidates in our last presidential election in the US, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Um, the conversation around Hillary Clinton amongst these accounts was that she was, not that she had like bad policies or that she was a, you know, a, a bad leader or that you, know, you disagreed with her position on the US involvement in Syria or whatever, whatever it is, like political stuff. Um, instead, it was that she was a criminal, which is uncommon for American political discourse to, or used to be, um, for us to talk about opposing candidates as if they should go to jail. 
Um, they talked about a, a scandal around her emails. They basically drove this scandal into the ground over and over and over again, which is kind of a long story. We don't need to get into it. Every American in the audience is probably groaning, like, oh, about her emails. Um, and they also referred to her, I think, ironically, given the topic of conversation that they were most interested in espousing, this kind of rampant anti-Semitism, they also talked about her as Hitlery, this like really aggressive, um, kind of really debased uh, style of political discourse that, again, was uh, relatively speaking uncommon in previous um, presidential elections. So really driving like a shift in the tone and the tenor of conversation around politics. And, so, and again, now we know, now the social media platforms and the US government and a bunch of like, private security companies like ours have found um, some of the content and released the content that the Internet Research Agency um, was publishing and encouraging its followers to publish. And it's exactly what you'd expect. I mean, it's kind of driving racial discord. Um, it's sort of making bold and false claims about former US politicians or current US politicians. Um, and I mean, there's a certain amount of like, we don't need to answer this question whenever people are getting killed in a place of worship, whenever politicians are being threatened with death by terrorists. I don't think, I don't think we, you know, that, that should be reason in enough, uh, uh, reason itself um, to deal with this problem. But I think in general, like, what does it really mean if we can't have nice conversations on the internet? What does it mean that our public discourse has been corrupted or social media is no longer reliable or has any integrity? What, what are the consequences of that? And I think the main things to take away is that what we used to think, uh, like, for example, in my youthful indiscretion, when me and my colleagues were gaming websites in order to make our content seem more popular than it really was, what we were really doing, like the kind of uh, uh, unspoken truth of the internet is that if you make it trend, you make it true, right? Like popularity is more important online than actual factual truth. And so because this dynamic can be manipulated, if you're in a position to do that, you can make anything true that you want. And this is a quote, so we have a, our director of research usually does these types of talks. She's a lot better at it than I am, so apologies to all of you that you kind of missed out on the good presentation. But she likes to talk about this, that the power to influence opinions increasingly lies with those who can most widely and effectively disseminate a message. This is the implication. So it's no longer the idealized internet that we all wanted. It's not the thing that we thought would bring like greater transparency and more democratic public discourse. Now it's a system that can be manipulated. And anybody who's powerful enough to manipulate that system can basically craft the reality that they want. So, and it's a pretty repeatable process. So I, I get together with a bunch of friends, maybe in an office in St. Petersburg, or maybe with a bunch of people in some anonymous web forum or a private Discord channel or subreddit or wherever it is that we hang out. And we decide that we're going to make something trend on mainstream social media together. Then we create some content, maybe we create a website, maybe we create a YouTube video, maybe we just come up with a funny hashtag or a bunch of memes. We launch the campaign on mainstream media, maybe by paying for social media amplification, by buying a bunch of accounts. Maybe I've got $100 in Bitcoin burning a hole in my pocket and I want to spend it on something. And with a relatively modest investment and a relatively small degree of coordination, it's possible to manipulate these mainstream social media conversations. And what's worse, and this happened with ISIS, it happened with Russian content, it happened with uh, like Iranian Facebook pages, it happens with domestic groups inside the US that are trying to use the same tactics. You're not only able, if you're able to manipulate the mainstream social media conversation, you can manipulate the mainstream com ma media conversation. Like, you can manipulate the way that, like, broadcast news works or, like, mainstream publications like the Washington Post or the New York Times cover your issue. Because every journalist in the universe uses Twitter and they're on it all the time, chatting with their other journalist friends and talking with people and putting their finger on the pulse of society, which is a normal thing to do. I'm on Twitter, it's a lot of fun. Um, but, what we've started to use it as a proxy for actual social consensus. And so we look at what's trending on Twitter, and we go, oh, that must be an important story. Let's cover it on MSNBC or CNN or Fox News or whatever it is. And like clockwork, you can basically take something from your tiny, like, dark corner of the internet with you and your buddies, and you can plaster it all over kind of mainstream mass media 
at least in the United States. Um, and this is a little bit more philosophical, but it's the end of the day and we're about to go drink, so I'll lay it on you. <laughs> There's a, I feel like I just brought everybody way down at the end of the day. <laughs> But I'll leave you with this. So there's this guy, um, Jürgen Habermas, and he's a philosopher and a professor and a writer and all that stuff. Um, and he had this idea that the truth is basically social consensus. This is kind of a weird idea, but it kind of relies on the fact that all of us live in some type of subjective reality. Uh, and bear with me. So like, uh, <laughs> so the only way that I can verify that the the way that my brain is interpreting the light from around me or the way that uh, my ears and my brain are interpreting like the sound waves that come into my ears or whatever it is. Like, the only way that I can va validate that I'm interpreting those signals in the same way that you all are is by having some type of communication with each other, right? So like, you might turn to the person next to you and go like, is there really a guy up on stage talking about really depressing topics right before we're supposed to go get a beer? And that person would say, yes, that's actually happening. And you go, oh, thank goodness. At least if we're having a hallucination, it's the both of us, right? Because it's totally possible that you're the only one in this room right now listening to me have this conversation. So we have to, we have to validate with each other. We have to communicate with each other and use our language to come to some consensus about what's real and what isn't. And because of that, and because we get most of our information most of the time online, so more than 51% of people, at least in the US, more than 50% of the population gets more than 50% of their news on social media. So the, basically, what we're doing is we're validating with each other on social media in our little online tribes and Facebook groups and following Twitter hashtags or, you know, in, in Instagram stories or whatever it is. We're, we're validating what's real. We're kind of coming up with th this sense of shared truth. And therefore, if you can manipulate those spaces, you can manipulate the truth. And so that's why there's a lot of talk about, like, fake news, like the realness of information. That's not it. This whole idea about disinformation is more about gaming the mechanics of distribution. It's manipulating the way that we have a conversation. It's hacking these platforms to hack people's behavior. It's not about uh, whether or not the Pope endorsed Donald Trump. Who cares? It's about the fact that I can make more people believe it by manipulating how we communicate with each other. So at the end of the day, somehow, on the social internet, we have to get back to what we've already figured out how to establish in real life is this idea of trust. We can encode our offline values into an online space if we can figure out this more fundamental problem that isn't about likes and retweets and angry face emojis on Facebook or whatever. Um, it's not about how many like comments or interactions or engagement your content gets or how much time that leads to you being on a website or how much we can monetize your, your eyeballs or your attention for a certain window of time. At the end of the day, the thing that's actually going to make public discourse and the social internet useful, maybe again, maybe for the first time, is figuring out how to encode trust into that space. Thanks very much. I think now we have some other questions. Thank you. That was great. And we have some time to answer some questions now. We'll start with an anonymous question that says, what do you think about the machine learning based moderation tools on social media? Do you think it's effective or just oil to the fire? Um, I, I mean, it's a little bit of both. I hate to give answers like that. It's like, it depends. Um, like every answer to every programming question on Stack Overflow. Um, but I, I, think it's, I think it's the only way to effectively like, moderate conversation at social media scale. Like, I, Facebook is getting a really hard time right now, and I think a lot of it's deserved. Their platform was pretty vulnerable for a really long time, and early on, they didn't really take it seriously. So I think they're making a lot of changes now. But like, like the, I think the thing that people didn't fully appreciate, at least early on, was then they were like, Facebook, why didn't you spot this? Facebook, you know, it's like there are like 2 billion users on Facebook. I think now there's 1.5 billion users because they got rid of 500 million fake accounts. 500 million fake accounts. But the, 
just, <laughs> that like got totally missed. And like the news story about that was like a Friday afternoon news dump and everybody was like, all right, whatever. But it was like, that was like a quarter of Facebook. It's like if, if a quarter of the world's population was fake. We were like, oh, well, I didn't know. Um, um, even so, a billion is a lot. That's a, I mean, it's like, it's like petabytes of interactions and engagements and contents like every day. And so to, the only way to recognize patterns and in information at that scale um, is, of course, to use machine learning. There's no way to do it. Um, with human beings. At the same time, I think, as was probably demonstrated by this presentation, and I think all of you who are practitioners know, machine learning is not up to this task in any way. So it's like it's where we have to get to ultimately, but in the short term, it's actually pretty naive and ineffective because we're trying to judge things like people's intent when they share information, which is something I think only humans are good at right now. Um, so the short answer is that I think it'll take a lot of people in the short term, and I think ultimately, if we're going to survive like as a species who communicates in this way, that we'll probably need to develop machine learning solutions to address the problem. So, you know, next. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what happened in April 2016? If you uh, don't... Yeah, uh, yeah I, don't, I didn't really get to it in the talk. Um, I mean, the, what I didn't realize as I was putting that together and was ultimately um, like confirmed by at least like US intelligence services was that that was when the um, internet research agency's sort of like formal campaign to influence the 2016 US presidential elections was launched. So they'd started that, they'd, they'd been active for a really long time. They'd had like uh, social media profiles and accounts that they'd been curating. Um, th there's some like famous ones that have been covered a lot in the press that were like these really high, basically like main or like peripheral political pundits in the US that they'd created out of nowhere, these persona accounts. It was actually really effective. Um, but the actual campaign to amplify a lot of that content uh, was launched in April of 2016, or in the spring of 2016. I had the same question. That's good. Um, from Nemanja, how they, Twitter and Facebook, did they give you access to the data of more than one million users? Uh, they did not. They did not uh, give me access to that. Um, I didn't take it. Uh, they make it available in an API. <laughs> um, so it, it, it took a long time to collect the data. Um, there's a, but at the time, it was possible to um, collect all of that data publicly through Twitter's API. I think it still is, although they've made the API access more restrictive. And then Facebook at the time gave a lot of access to individual user information through the Facebook Comments API. So you could go to a Facebook page, um, and you could get all of the comments, and not just the comment text, but you could also get the publish date, um, and then the user name and ID. So you could start to associate like unique users with a lot of the conversations they were having. So you could find users that posted like 500 times a day on like Donald Trump's Facebook page and stuff like that, which you can't do anymore. Um, I think from their point of view, to make the platform more secure, it also makes it more difficult for researchers um, to hold them accountable. But, um, but yeah, through the public APIs. And Data Girl is back with a question that says, do you think that data analysis can help catch real criminals, pedophiles, et cetera? Um, the answer to that is yes, it already is. Um, there's a, so some of the work that I've done um, has been with an organization in the US Department of Defense called DARPA. Um, DARPA, the famed inventors of the internet, as they like to remind everybody. Um, but it's like Google X, but for the US kind of national security machine. Um, and they developed a program called Memex, M-E-M-E-X. And if you read about it, one of the things that they were able to do was track um, uh, sex traffickers across the dark web and then into the open internet. So they'd look at conversations that happened around major events, which is where a lot of sex trafficking happens. It's like a Super Bowl or like an F1 race or some other kind of like global event where there's a lot of travel. Um, and they tracked conversations about kind of in-person exchanges of, of people who'd been sold into uh, sex slavery. And then they tracked it all the way back to the dark web using data analysis and machine learning, mostly like kind of uh, large graph analysis. Um, and lots of data acquisition. So 100%. And then the people do catch um, pedophiles all the time. The social media companies are actually really good about this. They have a um, shared database where they've, they've hashed, like they've, they've taken a bunch of images 
and then they've like hashed the content of those images, and so they basically have a registry of every time they've seen uh, pedophilia on any of their platforms. And so everybody can dip into that common reservoir and check against that database whenever content shows up on their platform, and it is really effective at stopping um, that type of activity and identifying the people who are trying to spread that type of content online. So 100%. And maybe we have time for one last one. It's a little bit short. How do you handle forms of sarcasm? Um, so the cool thing about that modeling technique is that it actually um, like contextualizes sarcasm, assuming that, because it's like this is all data analysis in the aggregate. So those like word defect models don't really work without like tens of thousands of documents or really like hundreds of thousands or millions of documents to be effective because you need a lot of examples to properly learn language from context. So, but even then, it learns sarcasm if it shows up often enough. So like there was this weird moment where um, members of this particular like domestic real people, like actual radicalized, like Pepe the Frog types uh, online, and they were um, hypothesizing that they were going to get kicked off of Twitter if they keep using racial and anti-Semitic epithets. So if they you know, keep saying terrible things about Jewish people, they might get kicked off of Twitter. They were concerned. And so they decided amongst themselves, this was kind of short-lived, but they decided that they would, um, instead of using the word Jewish, they would say, OK, we'll call Jewish people Googles and then we'll call black people Facebooks, and they'll never be able to block us because we'll just be talking about Google and Facebook, like, like you know, tricked you, suckers. Um, and of course, everybody realized pretty quickly that that was a stupid idea. But, the, um, but, but this type of model basically would pull out the synonyms. So it would say, like, amongst this group of users, the word Google is basically a direct synonym of the word Jewish. And you'd be like, oh, well, I mean, you can call it whatever you want, but you're talking about Jewish people. Like, I can see right through your, your clever ruse, Nazis. Um, so anyway, that's, that it, it's actually pretty good about picking up that type of context. Um, it's different than a normal, it's different than like a sentiment-based machine learning classifier, like a text classifier, which many of you might be familiar with, like a supervised learning model where you might say, like, tell me if this statement is positive or negative, and those models are pretty bad at um, identifying sarcasm, but it's kind of a different problem. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, y'all.